Hey, this is Latif Mikado, and you're listening to the Good Night Freestyle Podcast, where I take some time each night to try and reflect on the freestyle scene, where it is, where it's going, and try to figure out how to sustain it, not just for future generations to enjoy, but also to benefit. So sit back, relax, and let's talk some freestyle. Hey, what's up? And welcome to the Good Night Freestyle Podcast. And this is episode 79. Um, it's Thursday night. What's the day? The 19th, March. Um, stepped outside for a little bit. Um, it's a beautiful night again. We've had some pretty decent nights out here lately. Um, uh, what I am noticing though tonight, uh, Compared to the other nights, there's a lot more crickets out here. I don't know if you guys can hear them, but it's like massive crickets out here. But uh, one thing for sure is my grass looks good. Um, yeah, I finally got out here and mowed the lawn. I have a riding lawn mower. This is what's funny. I, I, I got riding, you know, Angel usually mows the lawn. Not because I don't want to do it, it's because she likes the exercise. She just... She likes the vibe. She likes to push it. So even though we have a riding lawnmower, she doesn't want to. She doesn't want to ride it. Me, I like to ride it because a lot of times I put my headphones on and I kind of I could now I could vibe. I just take my time and you know. So right before well last summer, okay, I ended up because I didn't use the the lawnmower for about uh, I don't know for like a whole season or two seasons. We didn't use the, the riding lawn mower because Angel wanted to push it. Um, so I had them come and pick it up so it could get fixed. We need, we need a new battery. Some of the cables were kind of worn out. It needed a few things. The engine needed to be cleaned out and uh, the, the liquids redone and so on. The fuels, whatever you call them, the liquids. And um, so it came back. Lawn mower was perfect, man. It was, it was, uh, it ran wonderful, right? So... I have only like, on my house here, I have a quarter acre. So, and I have a pretty big yard, front yard. My front yard to me seems bigger than my backyard. So, I got on my riding lawnmower and I've, I've already mowed the lawn a few times. And this time, um, my granddaughter is on the driveway with her friends and these two kids that, brother and sister that live across the street. And they're all there playing and they, they have the chalk and they're tagging up my driveway. And... I'm noticing, I started noticing this on the last one, but I didn't pay it much mind. I'm noticing that there's these lines in my grass. Lines, like the, like, like, and I'm looking, I'm trying to figure out why, why is this happening? Now, the, one of the reasons why I sent the lawnmower back before is because the deck, the way the blades are, uh, was off a little bit. It was kind of like, it, it wasn't secured. So I thought, well, maybe they didn't tighten it because now it's leaving like streaks in the grass. Like the grass doesn't look even. Like I'm looking back and it really looks bad. And now I mowed the lawn like that the week, you know, like the week before. I saw it was bad, but it really didn't like, it didn't register. I had other things on my mind. I saw it. I was like, okay, cool. In a couple of days, it'll be, it'll be fine. You know, the wind will hurt it. It'll probably rain, whatever the case. And it'll even out. And sure enough, it did. So this time, I'm doing the whole grass, and I'm in my own vibe. I'm not really looking at what I'm doing. But then, um, Santana's friend, the boy, he's about, I don't know, 10 years old. So he points to me. He goes, hey. I said, what? Oh, this is what's so funny is that his mom is a landscaper. So she has across the street her truck, and she has all, and, and you see him out there. He does the 360. He drives the regular one. He does the push mower. He does the edges. I'm talking about this kid is 10 years old, man. And he rocks this stuff, you know. I don't hire them, not really to save money because we're here. We just, we might as well do it, you know. I think I had her do it one time or her husband's. I forgot. But um, we do it, you know, when we have the time. And um, so he tells me, he goes, hey, man. He goes, He's pointing at me now. The engine is running and I can't hear him. And he's pointing. So finally, I'm like, why? Why? He's saying something. So finally, I turned off the machine. I said, what's up? 
He goes, man, you got a flat. I'm like, I got a flat. He goes, yes, yeah. so I get off. <laughs> I get off the lawnmower and I look around, walk around. I don't see a flat, man. <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about? I have a flat. He goes, he goes that's why it's leaving the streaks. So I'm like, yeah, I don't have a flat. He goes, yeah, yeah. He goes, get back on. <laughs> get back on it. <laughs> so I get back on it and sure enough, he goes, now look, I peek over. I look at the tire. It was the back tire. And sure enough, that shit is flat. I was like, oh, man. So I'm like, damn. So now I got to take it and I drive it back to the backyard and I'm like, man, I just had this thing worked on, you know, but uh, I didn't want to call the guy because the guy, they have to come. They charge me just like $80 just to pick the damn thing up. So now I have to go and find time. I don't even know if now's a good time to do it. I think we're just going to push the lawnmower and uh, go and get a tire. Now, meanwhile, I'm looking for somebody to put the tire on. I've just never done it. My nephew's like, yo, you can do it yourself. They're easy. Just kind of lift it up in the back and just change the tire. I'm like, and he's right. I could probably do it in five minutes. And I'm just, I'm just, uh, I just did that, 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 uh, handyman shit is just not for me. Just not, it's not my vibe, you know, but, um, but yeah, man, we're not, we really don't have the green thumb. You know, we really, I think my bushes look horrible. Like, what I want to do is I have a bunch of, like, just in my front yard, I have three and a half trees. I want two and a half trees out of here. And in the back, I have one, two, I have two trees, right? One, two. Yeah, I have two trees. I like them both out of there. And I have some bushes in the back. I like to get rid of those. I'm not going to do it myself. Everybody's like, yeah, you just have to trim it down and, and you cut it. And I'm like, man... I really don't want to do that. <laughs> I really don't want to do it. I'd rather get, not only that, the ones in the back are pretty high. Now, when I bought this house, they were so tiny, these trees, that they had that um, that green stick that they did, that they used to support it. And yeah, I never really paid it much mind, but as the tree got big and that tree got huge to the point where it went from basically being my height to now scaling over my house, like the branches actually go over my house. Those I trim. Those I'm able to get. I'm able to get those down. But um, it would. They got. It got so big that 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 stick, that green support stick, <coughs> ended up embedded into the trunk of the tree. That was crazy. Um, I, I ended up getting it out because it just looked crazy. Um, but uh, but yeah, you know. I mean, I like the trees. I like all of this stuff, but um, not for my property. I think my property is too small to have so many trees. Now, I had another property around the corner. Um, that was an acre, and it was crazy. That was an acre, and they only had one tree, <laughs> you know? So this is a quarter acre, and I got, what, seven trees or six trees. It's crazy. But, um, but yeah, so I, w I would like to try to get see if I could get that done uh Maybe this summer, maybe in the fall, probably be better in the fall. Uh, right now, I don't think anybody's trying to do anything, uh, so I'm not going to mess with them. But um, but yeah, but it looks good, though. I cut it. I, I, I It started growth back right away, though. I mean, I just cut this yesterday. It's already, I can already see where it's um, starting to grow. It's just uh, the sun out here in North Carolina, and then it rains. And like, if, you, if you're going to cut your grass... And then it rains, like you go in the house and it rains, and then the sun comes out the next day. You look out, it looks like you didn't even cut the grass. It's crazy. You know, it's nuts. So, but, you know, I, listen, I was born and raised in the Bronx. We didn't have this, man. Like, grass was like, was, you know, that was like a luxury. It's like, ooh, wow, you got, you got grass, <laughs> you know? And I remember when I first bought this house, and that was the exciting. Like, I, I was on top of it. I came out here, man. I went right away <laughs> when I bought this house, and I bought the riding lawnmower and I bought a push lawnmower and I bought a cedar and I bought um, the plow thing, whatever, that thing that has the little spikes that kind of, uh, the tiller, I guess it's called, it picks up the dirt so you can throw seeds and fertilizer. I had the, the fertilizer and the seeding, the grass seeder machine that you push through. I mean, I have all this stuff and I, I might, maybe for like the first one, maybe two seasons, I was on top of it, like I was proud. I was looking at my grass, like was standing on the side, you know, with my hands on my hip, like I was Superman, like I, I did something incredible, you know. I'm looking at everybody else's grass. I'm like, yeah, man, 
Now I'm like, oh, shoot. I basically cut my grass to, to keep up with the Joneses so I don't look all jacked up, man. But uh, <clears throat> um, I had someone that used to, when I had all the houses, I have five here, um, I used to have someone that used to do all of them. He used to come and knock them all out. <clears throat> but um, the other houses I used to not be able to watch, so they didn't really do a good job. A couple times I got complaints like right after them, I wound up letting them go. But um, now I just I just do that. I don't have those homes anymore. I got rid of those um, right after the recession. Once the recession went in, I was like, okay, cool, boom, got rid of them. Uh, and now I just have this one as of, as of right now. I think next year we'll probably look and go back into the market because um, I think we're gonna get a, a little dip in uh, in real estate, you know. So, but um, but yeah, yeah. My actually my first house. I don't know if I've ever spoken to you guys about this, but my first house um, was just funny. It was just a coincidence. My first house was um, on Intervale Avenue in the Bronx. And it was crazy because I was studying the No Money Down program with Carlton Sheets. Now, if you guys remember Carlton Sheets, a lot of you guys probably remember, Carlton Sheets was the old dude that you would see on the infomercials like 2 o'clock in the morning. And what he was doing is he was buying homes for no money down. And so I used to watch his infomercials and I used to read, by that time I was reading a lot of books on real estate. Like I was really going to hold in buying real estate, you know? Now, now mind you, you know, I wasn't the best prospect for a mortgage at all. Think about it, okay? At that time, my kids weren't with me. Okay, now I got my kids to live with me pretty young, but when they were still young, very young, um, they were still with their mother. So uh, I had child support that was handling. I had um, I was a I had felonies from my past. Um, I had no basically no collateral whatsoever. Um, and worst case of them all, I was self-employed. Yo, nobody wants to hear that. They don't want it. And then you're talking about self-employed in the music business. You know, to most people that say, yo, I'm in the music business, most of those people are not getting paid. I know, you know, because I remember when I used to joke like that, when I was dabbling in the music business and not making a penny, and I used to meet other people <coughs> in the biz music business that were basically at my level. I used to be like, what do you do? Oh, yo, I'm in the music business. Oh, okay, so you broke too, huh? He goes, yeah, man, I'm broke. You broke. I said, hell yeah, I'm in the music business. So it was a big joke. Um, thank God I was able to leave that, <laughs> that level. Um, a lot of those people stayed where they were, but I was able to move up out of that. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so banks didn't want to hear anything like that. So I started, you know, studying this Char Carlton Sheets uh, course. And, and I mentioned to you guys before, when I study, like, I go gun haul. Like, I would buy a desk, which I have now, a six-foot folding table desk, okay, and I would keep it clean, and all I would put on there would be my notes, my notebook, my papers, my, everything I need to study, you know, um, and I would just hit hours and hours of just absorbing this stuff, just really, just learning it, thank God I like to read, because it's, it's how I learned pretty much everything that I've ever done in my life, you know, and, um, and I remember, uh, finally, and I created this entire book on, like, I created my own program, my own step-by-step -step program using the Carlton Sheets program, even though his program was good, but I, I thought I was able to make a more efficient um, step guide, and that's what I did. So once I did that, I said, okay, you know what? I'm ready. I'm going to go out, and I'm going to start looking at homes. Now, by that time, now, actually, this was before I was with Angel because I was already going into Queens and stuff, and I was living in Queens, and I started looking around for, at the houses. Now, mind you, Carlton Sheets shows the video of him walking to the homes, finding out the price, talking to the owners, making the deals. I mean, it was really, it was like hands-on. It was a practical guide, and so you see these videos, and they were VH tape videos, you know? I ended up buying the, seat, the DVDs later on, but when I first started, they were all VHS tapes, and, um, and I remember he was buying homes. These homes are 43,000, 60,000, 70,000, 80,000. I mean, I didn't even see anything that was over 100 or even 100. Like everything was on those numbers. 
So now, remember, I had never in my life priced a home, okay? Never. So in my mind, and I had no concept at all of the value of a home, especially in New York City, okay? So now I'm in Queens, and anybody who's from New York knows Queens has some of the most expensive homes. And so I started around the, the Jackson Heights area, which is the area that I was more familiar with because I grew up there. I started walking around there. I started, I went, I went, I started following the papers and finding the homes that were in that area. And I'm noticing that all of these homes are 500,000, 400,000, 700,000. And I'm looking at these houses, I'm like, yo, where are these $40,000 homes or these 70,000, where, where are these homes? These homes do not ex exist. I remember going back and turning those, um, those video cassettes back upside down, you know, uh, look behind them to look at the date to see, yo, know, when were these things recorded? Like, what was the copyright? Was this like in the 1950s or something? Like, what was going on here, you know? And, um, but no, they were pretty current. They were only a few years, three, a few years old. And there's no way that homes are going to be going from 40 grand to up to 750 grand in just a few years. So I didn't get it. I just didn't get it. And then, I ended up getting with Angel and moving to the Bronx. Now I'm in the Bronx, so I'm like, okay, you know what? Maybe I needed to not be in Queens, you know? And I moved in a, a building. It was a, it was a, it was a brownstone that her family owned. It's been in the family for years. And you know, it was like five siblings that owned it. And um, they were all getting older. They were all getting older. Uh, they were very, basically, they were all old by, at that point, you know. Uh, I think the youngest one might have been in, in the 70s or something, you know. And uh, so I ended up, when me and her got together, that's when she saw that I was a different kind of character. <laughs> because I was obsessed myself, you know. I'm here living in her apartment, basically. And I took my whole setup, my six-foot table, laid that out. And I would get up every morning, every, every morning, first thing in the morning, cup of coffee, and sit there and go over all these notes. And then finally, I said, okay, I bought a map of the Bronx, and I said, now I'm gonna go out there, and I'm going to hit the Bronx. I'm not gonna drive, I'm going to walk, so that way I'm gonna try to stay within the, in the area. And I started to do that. What happened? The same thing. 400,000, 500,000, 700,000, a million dollars. I was like, yo, and this is the ghetto. Holy shit. Now, the only difference, though, in the Bronx, the houses I was looking at, they seemed bigger. Like, they were bigger homes. And uh, and they were basically more or less the same same prices as the one in Queens. The ones in Queens, but the ones in Queens were smaller, you know? Um, so I was like, man. So I ended up finding out that the home that we were, we were actually renting it from the family. And that was cool, it was a brownstone, it was two stories plus a basement, bunch of rooms, I mean, it was dope, dope. And it was built in, I think, 1901, I believe, or no, 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 18 something, it was in late 1800s. And um, uh, it used to belong, it used to be a mansion, it used to belong to a dentist way back in the days. And um, I remember finding out that somebody had made an offer to them for $100,000. Now. This was the deal. They considered that, but they turned it down. They considered it, but they turned it down. So I thought about it. I said, mm. I said, man, I would love to have this house. The only thing is that one of the uncles lived upstairs, and I knew that was a big concern to the family. And so I said, well, listen, they're older. What can I do? So I ended up offering them 150000 and I figured there's five of them in the siblings. I figured they could split the money, $30,000 each, okay? Now, now, it took a while, and I ended up talking to Angel's father about it, and I explained to him, I said, listen, y'all love to, you know, it's for us, we're gonna get married, and this could really help jumpstart our lives. And, and so he talked the rest of the family into it, and we all agreed, and the family liked me, so that, that was a big plus, and they agreed. Now the problem, I had to get the mortgage. Now I had never done this. The only person that I knew had, that was really, really, you know, had done a lot of real estate was my brother Dennis. Now, Dennis owned at one point, like something, I don't know, like 20 homes in New Jersey at one point. So he was very familiar with, you know, getting mortgages and the whole game. 
And I remember because he was the first one to get me a book called No Money Down when I was like in my teens. So we're talking about early 80s. So I read this book in the 80s, but never utilized it. Like I, it didn't, wasn't interesting to me. Even though I read the whole thing, it wasn't interesting. It was interesting later on. So I ended up calling my brother. I said, hey, man, I said, I need to get a mortgage. I explained the whole situation. I said, how do I go about doing this? He said, the best thing to do is contact a mortgage broker. He goes, they cannot get paid unless they get you a mortgage. So they're going to do everything they can to get you the mortgage. All you have to do is provide them with what they ask for. So I did that. And I called a few mortgage companies. Finally, one of mortgage broker brokers finally one agreed to help me out. Well, actually, I had a couple that agreed to help me out. However, even with all the information I was giving them, they could not get me a mortgage so i went back to my brother and i was like i was like hey man i'm having a hard time i'm not able to get a mortgage he goes really he goes how many people did you contact i said man i must have dealt with like at least five or six of them he goes oh that's not enough i'm like what do you mean he goes hit 50 of them he goes when you get to the the 50th one he goes then call me back so now i'm like oh okay so you know i kind of you know yeah yeah okay okay and i hung up the phone and I'm sitting there, I'm like, ah, oh, this is like ridiculous, man. Reach out to call 50 mortgage companies, 50 mortgage brokers. And I wasn't interested. And I remember late at night thinking about that. I kept thinking, I kept thinking, I kept thinking. And I said, man, you know, I'm here asking this guy for help. He's already done this. He's given me, he's my brother. He's not going to steal me wrong. He's got no financial gain or loss in it. No incentive, no motives. And he's given me the best advice that he felt, and he was 1,000% confident that this would work. So the next morning, I started to make a list of all these mortgage companies. And I got on the phone, and I, I started to hit these places up. And I started to, to call and call, and, um, and, uh, and then finally, uh, I ended up speaking with Angel's brother, who had a friend who happened to be a broker and he was pretty new and he was hungry. It was a young guy. So we said, okay, you know, and I must have been already about at like maybe 20. I was already about 20 brokers in. So I said, hey man, let's, but at this point I was trying everybody. Like I was, it was constant. Like I was becoming a pro at this. So finally we go, I remember this guy was, I think was like in Yonkers. So we go to his office now he's like really like he's gonna help us and it took some time back and forth back and forth and then finally he did it he got me a mortgage and this was the crazy thing I only needed hundred and fifty for the deal he got me two hundred and twenty thousand dollars okay and we were able to like do a gift of equ equity and I forgot how how we worked it out but and it was all legal nothing was illegal everything was done up and up and I remember he, he he got us this money which allowed me to not only purchase the house but also walk away from the table okay so I purchased the house with no money down and walked away from the table with sixty thousand dollars in my pocket now I can sit here and do the math but this is going to be boring I probably won't remember half of it half of it but I remember walking away from the table with 60 grand plus the house now I took that sixty thousand dollars and at that time, you can actually hire an appraiser. And the appraiser will come in and they'll appraise your home. And then you could go and refinance. Because I know now I was I was strapped. You know, all, all I had was that money. So I um <clears throat> so I knew that whatever I had to do to this house to up the price on it, um, I had to do it right. So I hired this appraiser to come in. And she came in and appraised the house for us. And then she told me. What I need to do, and I told her, I said, listen, this is what I have. I have 30000 <clears throat> If you had 30000 and you want to bring the price up to this uh, for this house, what would you do? And she told me what to do, and we ended up doing it. And I was able to bring the house up to uh, valued at, appraised at like $390,000. Okay? So I was like, okay, cool. So I got the house back up. I got it up to $390,000, right? So and then um, I knew at this point we had a break, a break and we had a home invasion. And I, at this point, I knew we weren't going to stay there that long. Now, I didn't want the relative to lose their home. 
So I said, you know what, I'm gonna put this thing on the market. Uh, it just wasn't the place, it wasn't, it wasn't the right place for us to live, not to have the kids there and so on. It was, get, it was getting kind of dangerous. They found like body parts in our garbage cans and stuff. So, so we ended up um, uh, refinancing the house. Now what happened was when I refinanced the house, I was able to pull out like $137,000. And when I pulled out the $137,000, I remember that business got a little shaky and it was getting, now my mortgage at that point was like, I don't know, almost four grand plus my utilities every month was about a thousand. And all I was getting from upstairs was like a clean 750 bucks because I was renting it to them. So they, they could stay there for the rest of their lives, but they had to pay. And um, so so things were getting a little kind of sticky, you know, and in the Bronx, like the insurance is high, your car insurance is high, like, you know, and then everything started to, to pile up and I was like, oh snap. And then when we had the break in, I knew that was dangerous because that was a home invasion. I mean, we had a big scuffle inside the house. It was a, it was a mess, but anyway, um, I knew at this point that to protect my family, we had to get out. So I had refinanced the house for that 137 and I ended up finding, uh, coming to North Carolina, um, through the recommendation of my nephew, who actually lived in the same neighborhood. And I was able to buy the house with for $10,000 less, so one twenty-seven. dollars Actually, it was for one thirty-seven. dollars It was actually the same exact price, but I was able to make payments on the final $10,000, and that was just so I could buy furniture and stuff, so when we moved in. So we actually bought the house free and clear. We bought it cash. And I remember because I was calling everyone to, um, I had my nephew here and I said, yo, go look at this house for me. And he was like, oh, beautiful house. I said, okay, cool, we're gonna buy it. He goes, what do you mean you're gonna buy it? I said, yeah. He goes, you're not gonna come see it? I said, I can't, I'm on tour. And I remember I was on tour, I was in California, I think, or Florida. And I remember doing the paperwork from the hotel lobby and having it faxed um, to close on the deal. So the first time I ever seen this house up close is the day that we moved in. So we had flown, flown Erica and Angel uh, in ahead of time and then me and Adam drove, we, we packed the truck and then hitched up our car and we drove to North Carolina. We've been here ever since. So, um, but um, it was crazy. Then we ended up eventually uh, selling the entire house. So we ended up selling it for, you know, 500,000. And then with the extra money, we were able to purchase more homes here in North Carolina. Well, we had one in Florida, we had one in Puerto Rico and we had three here. And that's how cheap now Carlton Sheets made sense to me because that was the price of the homes out here. A lot of the homes, like if you went and bought, you know, homes, you know, that outside of subdivision, now you can find houses for, you know, 40. Because I bought a home for 42, another one for 75. I bought it for like 79. I bought another house for 65 or 68. I bought another house for uh, got 17,000. I mean, I was buying homes really cheap and I was making a killing when I was, and we held on to these homes and rented them out during the recession. So that whole, from like 2007, all the way to like, I don't know, 2014 or 15, we were, we were cool. Like that we, we didn't feel that pinch, you know? So, but we ended up, you know, we're not good landlords, you know, we would just flip. So instead of just flipping the homes, what we did is we held on to them and we wrote them out during the recession. And you know what? And it worked out. And that wasn't even planned. That was just something that happened. So I, I won't even take credit. But if I want to take credit, it was a damn smart ass idea. It worked out for us. And we were able to live really comfortable while a lot of people were struggling, you know? So, you know, now we still have our one home, the first one that we purchased, and we love this home, and we, we, we were thinking about buying another one, a bigger one, which we still might, but we'll hold on to this one. Uh, and if we buy another one, most likely it's gonna be cash as well. Um, but, uh, but yes, you know, but you know, real estate, you know, anybody who has any, any kind of um, interest of getting into real estate or buying and flipping or buying and renting, um, man, it, it's, it, it's a great opportunity. You're not gonna lose with real estate. Okay, keep in mind also trailers are not considered real estate. So don't think you're buying a trailer and it's real estate, it's not. So, um, but homes that have land, that are part of land, yeah, that's real estate. And they're always a great, great investment. So if you ever thought about doing it, I suggest you do it. And if any of you guys have any questions that I can answer, I mean, I bought enough enough homes to kind of got, I got a little feel for it. Um, um, feel free to hit me up and whatever I can answer. If I can't, I'll try to find the information for you and uh, try to direct you in uh, the right direction. Some of the, the some of the uh, the rules have changed um, 
from the time when we were doing stuff. So, but uh, you can figure that one out. So, but anyway, I just wanted to share that with you guys. It was just uh, something that popped in my head, and uh, and uh, I'm done. I'm done for tonight. So until tomorrow, guys, be cool and good night, freestyle. Before I lay me down to sleep, I pray to hear a freestyle beat. For if I die before I wake, I hope to make it to the break.